Now, this Quran came from heaven, Muslims believe. And it happens in a context. And I want to say just a word about the context in which this word comes down. The context. And this would be 7th century Arabia. <clears throat> the first area of context is Christian. The Christian context. At the time of Muhammad, the Christian church had spread all around the Arabian regions. Syria in the north, mostly Christian. Even present-day Iran uh, was, uh, in those days, called Persia. Strong Christian minorities. Iraq, mostly a Christian nation. The Middle East, where Israel, Palestine is today, mostly Christian. Egypt, mostly Christian. Not only, and Ethiopia, not only were these Christian nations or Christian, uh, Christian societies, um, but, um, but also they were translating the Bible into their languages. Most of these uh, Christian communities around Arabia had the Bible in their language. So it was a very vigorous Christianity. They were sending missionaries all the way to China and deep down into Africa, a very vigorous Christian community. Uh, within Arabia, however, there were very few Christians for they did not have the Bible in the Arabian language. There were some nomadic tribes that were Christians, few, and here and there are some Christians. But within Arabia itself, where Muhammad was born and grew up, there wasn't very much Christian presence. An awareness, an awareness of Christianity, ideas about it. Um, and you find as you read the Quran that that awareness of Christianity is very much a part of Muhammad's experience. In fact, he was a merchant. And he would go to Syria occasionally in his uh, merchant enterprises and surely met Christians in Syria. Who knows, I'm just guessing this, but I wouldn't be surprised if he might have spent his overnights in a monastery operated by the churches in, uh, in Damascus in Syria. Um, so the Christian influence is present as you read the Quran. You see an interaction, like for example, the statement we made just a bit ago, that Jesus is the Messiah. That's Christian influence that, led, that, that, that you see reflected within, within the Quran. Another aspect of the, uh, of the context is Jewish. There is the Jewish context. And particularly when Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina and he arrived in Medina, he met large Jewish communities there. And so also within the Quran, as you read, there's a lively interaction uh, between the developing Muslim community and, and the Jewish community. In fact, there's more about Moses in the Quran than, uh, than, than about Muhammad. Uh, Moses is a very prominent prophetic figure within, within the Quran. It's very significant Jewish, Jewish influence. Um, and uh, many of the... Uh, uh, practices of Muslims um, seem to have uh, entered into the community through Jewish influence. As for example, <laughs> Jews pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. Muslims pray five times a day facing Mecca. You know, this idea of bowing in prayer facing something somewhere. Jews towards the, towards the uh, what had been the temple and Muslims toward the, uh, toward the Kaaba. That practice of bowing towards, towards something. It's, it's, a Jewish, it's a Jewish practice, which uh, became very, very Islamic. Another stream is the Hanif. The Hanif stream. The Hanif were people within Saudi Arabia, within Arabia, who worshipped the God of Abraham, whom they referred to as Allah. Muhammad's family, his, 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 his uh, tribal group, were mostly Hanif. And so he himself was considered to be a Hanif. And that's what he preached, worship only the God of Abraham, the all other gods. This was a Hanif concern, these people within Arabia who uh, worship the God of Abraham and encourage people to do so likewise. So that's another very strong stream that weaves through the development of the Muslim community back there 
in the seventh century Arabia. The seventh century, seven, uh, 600 years after Christ. The other stream, the final one I want to talk about, is the Jahiliya. The Jahiliya are the polytheists. These are the people who worship many gods. And like I mentioned yesterday, uh, within Mecca, in the Kaaba, there was 360 gods that were worshipped. So Mecca was a vigorously polytheistic uh, city. Every time a tribe would want to make peace with another tribe, they would bring the gods of those two tribes together and put them in the Kaaba so the gods would live peacefully side by side. They figured if the gods are living peacefully, then we should also be peaceful with one another. And they had regular pilgrimages toward the Kaaba. All of that sort of thing was polytheistic. Even the black stone was at the center of polytheistic worship, which then was reinterpreted as a sign of the Quran that God sent from heaven when uh, the Muslims took over the Kaaba. So you have the polytheistic stream as well. And the Quran is very exercised about polytheism. The Quran is extremely um, forthright in its condemnation of polytheism. There's only one God, Almighty. All these gods are false, was the message that Muhammad preached with great fervor. And so you find this lively confrontation within the Quran against the polytheists and the assurance that if you practice polytheism, that's a sure ticket to final judgment uh, at the end of the age. So you have all four of these streams. I think of it like a rope with strands of um, uh, going within that rope, all woven together. The Christian, Jewish, Hanif, and polytheistic streams weaving together. And the Quran is uh, a calling forth of a faith in only the creator God, leaving all other gods, a, a, a call for living justly and righteously, which is in lively interaction uh, and confrontation oftentimes with these other streams, sometimes incorporating aspects of these other streams, sometimes uh, critiquing them. Now, if Baju Katarega, that wrote the dialogue with me, were here today, he would say, David, I want to make a comment. And this is what he would say. David, remember that the Quran is eternal, coming from the mother of the book that we talked about yesterday. And the Quran came down. It is Tanzil, sent down, a sent down revelation. Let me illustrate a bit my understanding of what this means for the Quran to be Tanzil. I'm going to just put this chair up here for a moment. Now, it'd be good if your Muslim were here to respond to what I'm saying, but this is what I would understand Katarega to mean. And I've asked Muslims this occasionally, and they always say, yes, you understand it well. That within the Muslim understanding, God himself does not come down, but he sends a book down. Now that book transcends history. You see, it's, it's very different than the Christian understanding where God comes down and meets us. Yesterday we talked about root events that create an abiding astonishment. That's at the heart of biblical revelation, where God comes down and meets us, comes down and saves us, comes down and pursues us, inviting us into his kingdom to be his covenant people, God himself coming down as Savior. But within Islam, no, God does not come down. But what he does, because he's merciful, he brings and sends his book down. And that book that he sends down transcends the context. It transcends the context. So this Quran comes down, but it hangs above history. It encounters history, but it transcends history. That would be the Muslim understanding. And so when I talk about these four streams, as I have done, Katarega would say, 
I would prefer, I would strongly urge that we say rather than that this is the context in which the Quran developed. And it represents a lively interaction among these various streams. David, I would rather you would say that this is the context in which the Quran came down. But the Quran itself was in no way whatsoever influenced by the context. It has come down from above. That, I believe, as I read and talk with Muslims, would be their understanding of the nature of revelation. It comes down, superseding context. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. But for me, as one on the Christian journey, it's very helpful to look at Islam as a movement that developed within an Arabian context. I, um, I, um, I, I, I don't believe that it is an eternal book in the heavens that supersedes context. I, 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 don't, I don't see it that way. I believe it. It's, it's a, I, I, you know, that every word in the Quran is somehow a copy of a heavenly original. If I believed that, I would be a Muslim. <laughs> and I, I don't, I don't, I, I've not been persuaded about that. <clears throat> Now, with the Muslim conviction that this Quran came down, there is a great concern about submitting to this will of God that God sent down in the Quran. There's a, that's a deep commitment of every faithful Muslim. Now, the question is, how do I know that I'm truly, truly submitting to God? Well, this is the way you know. You know by emulating the way Muhammad did things. And this is called Sunnah. By obeying and submitting to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. That's the way he did things. And so within Islam, there is a huge um, uh, commitment to understanding the way Muhammad did things and then emulating, imitating how he did things. Uh, for example, there is a sunnah, uh, there is a description of the prophet that says that when he would comb his hair, he would start on the right side and then he would go to the left. So, every Muslim who wishes to follow the sunnah of the Prophet will comb his or her hair from the right to the left. You see, that's the sunnah of the Prophet. Furthermore, when he would put on his shoes, he would put the right shoe on first and then the left shoe. So all faithful Muslims will attempt to put the right shoe on first and the left shoe next to emulate the way the Prophet did things, his sunnah. Well, how do we know what his sunnah is? That's the hadith. It's the hadith to tell us what the sunnah is. <clears throat> the traditions. How did the traditions happen? Well, after his death, and people were becoming concerned about submitting to the sunnah of the prophet, so that in every way they will truly submit to the teachings of the Quran. And Muhammad is seen as the perfect example of what that means. They, the scholars and the companions of Muhammad began to collect together sayings and actions that he did and form them into a tome. It took 200 years for this to take place. Uh, people would try to memorize and learn and investigate and, uh, and uh, travel and so forth all doing investigations on stories about how the Muhammad did things. And then these were formed together into a massive system of writings called the Hadith. So uh, it took, as I say, 200 years for these uh, Hadith to be formed. The most famous, I think the most famous Hadith, there's several of these Hadith <coughs> systems, but the most famous one is by Bukhari. By Bukhari. 
And <laughs> I took 200 years. And so after the Hadith were formed, then our Muslim friend said, oh, in addition to that, we need application to apply this teaching, this practice, these, these uh, actions of Muhammad in a very specific way to every aspect of life. And so for the next 200 years then, they wrote another system of books which is called the Sharia. The Sharia. The systems of law. And so for our Muslim friends, you have three sources that guide and direct the way they shall conduct themselves. Primary is the Quran, and many little boys and girls around the world will memorize the Quran so that its teachings are incarnated within their souls. And then, at the other level, are the Hadith systems. These, these, these volumes of writings that describe how Muhammad did things, telling stories about what he said and what he did, so that they can submit to the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, emulate the way he did. And then at the outer layer, you have the Sharia systems, which are voluminous writings covering every area of life, um, drawing from the Hadith and from the Quran in passing on that instruction. So Islam is very much bounded by systems of law that help to define how one should conduct oneself in every aspect of life.